Um, so hi everyone, thank you so much for joining in, especially to our panelists for uh, taking out the time and sort of uh, supporting us through all of the coordination process required and all, especially to our moderators as well for curating this session. I'm super, super excited and thrilled to be one of the participants <laughs> and uh, sort of um, to um, learn a lot through the session. Um, I am Sanjana, I work as an associate of the Long Research Collective. And I welcome you all to the final day of the inaugural edition of the XSDG and Conference, which is an initiative of Belong. A little bit about Belong for more context. Uh, Belong is a social innovation platform that seeks to offer discrimination-free services to people who are otherwise discriminated against on the basis of their identities. It could be on the basis of their caste, gender, race, disability, sexuality, so on and so forth. Uh, we run programs for about three major verticals, and these are called the Research Collective, which is what the Unconference is a part of. Then there's Mental Health Collective. We do a lot of work around um, identities and its intersection with mental health challenges. Then there's Literature Collective. That's more to do around art and culture and diversity and inclusion. Um, the Unconference is a part of one of our major initiatives of Belong, which we recently started, and it's called uh, XSDG, which is a global platform to promote truly intersection and inclusive development. Um, so far, we've been working uh, towards curating resources in terms of research papers, um, uh, uh, journal papers, uh, uh, reports, data sets that are focused on development and social domains through the lens of intersection identity. Uh, now on to the Unconference. Uh, the Unconference is in collaboration with our wonderful partners and organizations such as Dalberg. Uh, GPAL South Asia and Breakthrough India. Uh, it started on the 18th and we've had about um, 15 to 16 sessions already and they've been all fantastic. And, uh, and uh, these are all around how SDG programming um, and funding can better address the needs of people who face prejudice and discrimination on the basis of their identities. Um, we've uh, been featuring and we've had um, a lot of sessions with uh, interactive sessions with thinkers, doers, funders, and development experts like all of you. And uh, uh, we do plan to sort of seek um, and shape concrete initiatives uh, that can be implemented going forward through all of the conversations we've lined up so far. So that's it from me. Uh, before we move on, I just want to take a quick moment to introduce our moderators who've been so supportive and have done a wonderful job in curating this panel. Um, Shruti, who is an associate partner with Dalberg based in Bombay. She advises private and public partners on building cities and urban development, inclusive business and investing for development. Ms. Mokena, who is uh, a principal in the Alberg Advisors um, and is a super accomplished architect, artist, creative, curator, global leader, scholar, and urbanist. So great to have you both here and I will let you take the stage on forward. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sanjana, for such a warm and uh, welcoming intro. Thank you to uh, my colleagues, uh, new and, and, and uh, more familiar. Uh, joining us on this special day. And thank you to all of you who are listening to this. Uh, this is quite an important um, discussion that we're having for a number of reasons. Um, it, really, it really comes as no accident if one looks at the sort of broader spectrum and trajectory of how the world has been pivoting over the last couple of years. If we look at uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and you know, associated other dialogues around identity and urban space, if we look at some of the lurching to the right, if you will, in certain countries and certain cities around the world. But at the same time, it's also balanced out by a different type of voice that's making a, a much more strident cry, if you will, for inclusive economic practices, inclusive spatial strategies, um, as well as inclusive politics. We are seeing um, around the world a, a sort of inflection point, if you will, where critical decisions are being made, value propositions are being recalibrated around the question of climate change, inclusivity, ecology, um, as well as the, our custodianship or stewardship of the planet. And this has huge implications for inclusivity as read through a number of lenses. So the core question uh, that the, the panel will be dealing with is really how can uh, the city in its sort of global um, uh, format um, participate in an urban development uh, program or agenda that is inclusive um, and fair and just, whether it's from an ecological, economic, or, an, or a social perspective. In order to answer that question, you know, we've gathered a, a number of some really amazing people here, scholars and producers of knowledge within their own right. Um, my dear colleague Shruti will actually introduce them. But let me just start by maybe 
reading a couple of lines to also help ground this idea about inclusivity. Cities are engines of growth and progress. You know, they contribute to substantial economic growth, they provide employment to billions, and enable innovation through cross-pollination of ideas and expertise. You know, cities are places of flows. More people are now living in cities than ever before, and recognizing this, a substantial effort with international development goes toward creating green, resilient, equitable, and livable, and indeed lovable cities, of which I hope my colleague will expand on that particular point. However, development activity in the urban development in cities still has significant blind spots, um, cul-de-sacs, um, and gaps linked to identity. Uh, less abled populations find it difficult to access transport um, or even access to housing. Uh, the density of recreational and, and green spaces is significantly less in, in Black neighborhoods or other places of color, and definitely in, uh, uh, for those of religious minorities. And there's also still significant housing discrimination linked to faith, gender, and sexual minorities. And in fact, the list could go on. We will have a discussion today with our esteemed panelists on what is the nature and extent of identity-led expansion in cities? Who is impacted the most? How do we understand identity-led exclusion? And how do we understand identity-led inclusion? What is the role of design within these cities? both at a physical uh, level in terms of the environment, but also at a policy level, and at a social level and a political level. And what needs to change to address these challenges? And last but not least, why is it important to have inclusive cities? With that, I'd like to hand over to Shruti, who will welcome our panelists and take us on forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mokena. This was such a a comprehensive setup of why we are here today. And thanks for laying this out so nicely. I would first want to like just maybe quickly introduce myself. I'm an associate partner with Dalberg in our Mumbai office. Um, and today have the pleasure of introducing our esteemed panel. We have three very distinguished um, speakers with us today. Dr. Amira Osman, Dr. Ghazala Jamil, and Ms. Kira Intrator. I would actually ask them to tell a little bit about themselves to the um, listeners, but also maybe share a very pivotal experience in their lives that has been instrumental in shaping their professional journey today. And maybe before I hand over the floor to them, I'll share my own experience. So before I joined Dalberg, I uh, worked for a real estate firm in Mumbai uh, for many, many years. And I used to head our CSR function here. And um, we did this program for improving the mental well being and financial health of our construction workers. And during this inauguration, like this, this, this ceremony where we were giving them certificates for their achievement, I saw these like men, young men, very confident and very sort of, you know, we sort of are, they were feeling so empowered that we understand this. You're going to do good health, you know, good practice. And that's why I sort of felt that there is really a big agenda out there, how we can bring everybody into the fold of our cities and making lives better for people. That was my pivot to being part of this development sector. And when I'm here today talking about inclusive cities, right? Um, Dr. Amira, may I request you to introduce yourself and, little, and share in a story from your life? Uh, happy to do so, Shruti. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks for including me in this uh, fascinating conversation and something that's very close to my heart. And I would consider it actually to be my life's work. I'm an architect. I'm a professor in architecture at the Schwann University of Technology in Pretoria, South Africa. I also hold the position of research chair in spatial transformation. Um, so for me, the issues of inclusion and exclusion are, are, are very key to my day-to-day -day work. Um, so yes, I, I have a master's uh, in architecture and a PhD in architecture. Um, and I've done those over many, many years in the Sudan. I'm originally from the Sudan. And uh, in, in when I, at a very young age, in 1992, I did a six-month uh, course in the Netherlands on housing. 
And I had an instructor there who, and I've been trained uh, in very conventional ways. I studied in the eighties architecture. I designed buildings. They were supposed to be functional, beautiful within uh, boundaries of a site. And I did it very well. I performed very well. And then I went to the Netherlands for the six months. And I always tell my students that the six months had more impact on me than all of the five years of doing a PhD. Because um, I was then made aware that a, a building needs to have um, impact beyond the site boundaries. A building has... Um, has to respond to the socioeconomic circumstances of building. So it, it suddenly just opened up uh, my eyes to the fact that as, as an architect and a designer, I could actually um, practice and teach in very different ways. Um, so and, and then uh, for many years, I was involved in community engagement projects. And for, for many years, very arrogantly, and perhaps based on the way that I was taught, I used to say, when we go out to communities, we are, skill, uh, we are transferring skills and we are transferring knowledge. It took me probably five to seven years of doing that before I changed that word of transfer to exchange. So when I went out to communities, my, my tone softened, uh, my terminologies changed, and now I could understand that, why, uh, that I was in this constant exchange with communities and we, it was a process of mutual learning. So those are the two experiences that I'll share and that really shaped my career going forward. Thank you so much, Amira, for sharing those with all of us. Um, Dr. Ghazala, would you like to introduce yourself and also share an experience with you? Thank you so much. Thank you, Shruti. Um, and uh, thank you to Belong uh, for asking me to be on this panel uh, and uh, to be able to uh, share some of my work here, hopefully. Um, uh, so I teach in uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi in a center called Center for the Study of Law and Governance. I'm actually a social worker by training. My PhD is from Department of Social Work, uh, Delhi University, where I also used to teach earlier. I've also briefly um, uh, taught as a visiting faculty in uh, School of Planning and Architecture in uh, uh, Delhi. Uh, where I taught some uh, courses related to, um, you know, social sciences, sociology, urban sociology to uh, planning uh, students. Um, uh, so, well, my interest in uh, the area related to the panel uh, discussion today uh, begins from my work in social work in, um, you know, uh, uh, urban and rural social movements. And my experience that, uh, uh, you know, the social realities of minorities in India were not really spoken of uh, or discussed uh, beyond just tokenism in academia and in civil society in India. Mm -hmm. So as a Muslim myself, as a resident of a Muslim uh, locality in India, um, and as an educator, it was, um, you know, really um, uh, striking uh, for me that uh, all the literature in urban sociology uh, and urban planning in India actually did not mention Muslims at all. Although of all the communities in India, uh, religious communities, Muslims are the most urbanized uh, uh, community in India. So that kind of triggered me and uh, um, you know, sort of motivated me to look into the question of uh, uh, special and especially housing segregation in uh, Delhi, New Delhi especially. And uh, that's the uh, sort of topic around which my PhD uh, is, uh, um, and, and it has been uh, now published um, as a book uh, titled uh, Accumulation by Segregation. So it's basically segregation uh, along identity lines that I've been interested in. And um, what I've tried to do is uh, to basically go beyond the descriptions and provide a few um, theories 
uh, or fresh question uh, through which we could see this uh, issue. Thank you for now. <laughs> Thank you, Gazala. And I do sort of, you know, I've of course had the opportunity of reading some excerpts from your book, but I need to get my hands on the full book. <laughs> uh, but we'll surely learn a lot today. Uh, Kira, would you like to go next? Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be part of this panel. Thank you. I'm very much looking forward to our exchanges. Um, so I lead urban and rural planning for the Aga Khan Agency for Habitat in Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, and Syria. So supporting our 900 field staff to develop uh, urban and rural planning. Um, projects as well as academic partnerships and innovation. So my focus really has been throughout my career um, to focus on ways to scale impact, whether that's from product design or UX design to methods of inclusive planning. So I really believe in the power of data, in the power of technology, but also the import uh, of the voice of the community that we work with. Um, and that really comes through in terms of the Aga Khan Development Network's ethos in really ensuring that governance systems um, are set up to have that inclusive voice and especially uh, with the gender inclusivity. Um, so Shruti, your great question about pivotal moments. Um, growing up, I think in a North African neighborhood in France um, in a very diverse community surrounded by mountains. I really think that where I grew up has formed who I am. So understanding that the cities or the villages that we grow up in are actually forming who we become and what we're interested in. So diversity is very important for me, inclusivity and access to nature. Um, I think the pivotal moment that I wanted to do urban planning really was when I was working in the US when I moved there in my early uh, 20s to work for a great organization called Year Up. And we were looking at expanding our workforce development program for urban youth into different cities in the US. And some cities we could expand into because there was transit to allow um, the youth that we were serving to get into the financial districts in the city center. But other cities we could not expand into just because of lack of transit. And it would take our students hours to get in to the city. So that really drove home how inequality is spatial in nature. And if that's the case, it goes on for generations. It's not just today, it's, it's impregnated in the way the city is in the skeleton of the city structure. So that I saw very immediately from a transit perspective. And when I was living in Mumbai, I adore Mumbai, um, but also I think the invisible critical infrastructure. I didn't have access to water for a week living in my apartment. Um, and it made me realize access to water is so important. You know, it's trucked in from di different areas um, and how critical infrastructure allows us to, to really flourish and be. Um, so that was another, you know, really drove home how important critical infrastructure and planning was. And then more recently, when I started working for um, the AKTN, looking at more governance systems that were already in place in Central Asia, and how important that was to have trust with the community to really ensure that um, any projects were moved forward. So those were different elements the identity formation of where we live, the fact that opportunity or lack thereof or inequality is really spatial in nature and how dangerous that is because that lasts for generations. Um, and then the import of a voice. So that's a bit of, of some of the stories that have led me to where I am today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kira. I'm actually gonna now ask Mokena to tell his story and then also, start with our panel discussion. These stories have been so interesting and you're already getting a lot of insights. So, but McKenna, I would love to hear your story. My, mine is uh, brief. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I, I totally agree with Kira about the, the formative nature of, of cities on one's youth um, and that sort of relationship. So I, I grew up in New York until I was about uh, 12, 12 or so. 
um, part, partly, partly in the city, but also partly in the suburbs, and uh, came back to Lesotho, which is where you know my my parents are from, and and it was it was quite a quite a shock at a number of levels. Um, the absence of trees, the um, the, the the lack of coherent urban infrastructure, like the the almost visceral uh, poverty um, that's expressed spatially, and when you're 12 years old, I didn't understand it right. Um, and I remember asking my my father, said, you know, why are there no trees, etc. He said, well, everybody's cut down trees, you know, to for firewood, you know. So coming from a place where there's central heating, right? So you don't associate nature as heating. To a place where all of the trees have been removed, um, and Lesotho is a beautiful country. Make no mistake, but but also it it does carry um, a a certain weight, if you will, that comes from from um, lack of development. And and for me, what what got me is was trying to understand how how is it that you could have these two extreme conditions on Earth at the same time? How can one country be so abundant? And another one so um, uh, deprived, and that, and to me, I couldn't, I couldn't reconcile it as it merely being a product of the people or the politics. There had to be something much deeper, something more structural, something much more embedded. And I started to understand the history of Lesotho in relation to South Africa, South Africa, which at that time was still an apartheid uh, state uh, that worked tirelessly for hundreds of years to destabilize its neighbors. Um, and it was not in the apartheid regime's interest to have successful black countries nearby because that would inspire local black populations to be even more rebellious. So, so it was weird to be in a sort of geopolitical context where, you, where you're seeing the impact of, of colonialism, frankly speaking, right? I mean, we can talk about inclusion at the micro scale of a person trying to get onto a sidewalk and I'm not diminishing anything from that sort of position, and I hope we'll cover those topics today. But there's also a much bigger geopolitical question around inclusion, where it's not just about city, whole countries get excluded from, from conversations, whole countries get excluded from regional economic strategies, whole peoples are not at the decision-making table about the future of the planet. So for me, that was that that kind of really triggered me. Um, and I, ever since then, I have this, I've always had this burning desire to undo geo, geopolitical and geospatial um, inequalities. And then, of course, South Africa itself is probably the you know probably the best <laughs> example that we have in the last two hundred years of, of orchestrated spatial inequality. And and the, the the sheer genius, mad genius though, uh, mad, mad genius of knowing that through space you can determine economies uh, for generations to come, you know. And 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 so 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 what got me going was really just to you know seeing two different worlds um, within hours of each other and trying to understand how is it that human beings could live in such diametrically uh, different um, conditions. Um, and, and a profound belief that it was an unnatural thing, right? It's not as if I saw this and said, well, that's just the way it is. To, to, quote, Bruce, to quote Bruce Hornsby in the range, I, I, I said, this is not the way it is. This is not the way it should be. Um, something's wrong and somebody, somebody did it. <laughs> so that, that, that was me. Yeah, so that, that, that was my pivotal experience. Uh, I would say. So really, really driven by injustice. Um, but to open up the... The discussion and, and I'd, I'd like to encourage the panelists to not only riff off the questions that we're going to raise but also reflect on some of our own experiences in their responses so um, um, this is not a, a linear dialogue it, it is a conversation um, I'm interested and I'll, and I'll point to you Amira you know you you've made this in a number of points before about um, you know Sudan and South Africa right and knowing a bit of your own personal experience in the profession and the work that you've done. Um, and, I, and I know that we've, we've, we've all encountered various forms of exclusion in one way or another, but tell us a bit more about maybe, you know, your, your understanding of Sudan um, compared to South Africa and, uh, you know, and exclusion there, are the communities which are at risk in in Sudan. I mean, obviously we could talk about South Africa, which we both know well, but I'm trying to draw some parallels 
especially given your 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 dual identity that you that you've recently um uh, reiterated on a number of platforms which is which i think is quite beautiful yeah thank thank you so much mokena um and yes uh, and and you put it uh, so well in terms of this uh condition in south africa where identity led exclusion uh, through race has been profound and for me in sudan uh, i could offer many many examples uh, but women in public space is, is a very big issue in Sudan. Uh, women in Sudan are constantly fighting for the right to be in public space, uh, for the right to the opportunities that public space offers. And, and one example, and, and I'm just using this as an example, I could say many more, but one example, um, Khartoum is at the meeting point of the Blue and the White Niles. So we actually have three rivers, um, very big rivers going through the capital city, which is a very unique geographical location. And along those river banks, there's a lot of uh, very small scale informal recreational activities um, and, and the tea ladies, uh, what we call in Sudan, the tea ladies are a key part of that. They, they are along the banks of the river, that's six river banks in the city. They're along those river banks, they're, 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 they, they trade, um, uh, uh, with this tea service and, and, and provide an environment where people can go out into the open space and relax and uh, that they're constantly fighting for that right to be. In 2016, I wrote an article uh, titled uh, um, how people have recognized uh, that space and planning matter. And we were um, unaware here in South Africa, suddenly we heard that school um, um, children and university students had been uh, imprisoned because they were protesting, because they had heard that some certain um, key locations and properties along the river banks, which are the most um, lucrative parts of Khartoum had been sold off uh, to investors. And when I investigated more, there was something called the Khartoum structure plan. And once you, uh, which had just been disseminated and they started um, implementing some of that. And when you look at that plan in detail, you can see the level of exclusion that will happen to women, to the small scale trader, uh, the, the privatization of what should be public land uh, along the rivers. So the, the, that, that's, um, I mean, so for me, the issue in Sudan always um, revolves around women in Sudan. That's, that's uh, been a key interest of mine, but also the Khartoum structure plan and how once you read it differently, you find that it has, it, 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 it's going to disadvantage so many, and yet people had gone out onto the streets, risked their lives, been imprisoned without necessarily making that link. But they knew that something was, was wrong. Places were being sold off. So, so they, they knew that their, their livelihoods were going to be affected, even though no one had the knowledge uh, or ability to critique the Khartoum structure plan. So I, I just want to make a final note linking up uh, around, uh, I, I was very interested in what our colleague had to say around Muslims being the most urbanized in India. That's such an interesting um, point uh, for me, uh, because in Sudan, um, Sudan has a very unique form of urbanism. For many, many years since Islam came to the country, all the urban centers in Sudan have developed around the burial place of a sheikh um, uh, or a religious leader. And uh, people believe that you get ilm uh, or knowledge in cities or in urban areas. So there's also a very unique relationship between the Sudanese and urban areas because that's where you get ilm. And even a, a major city like Umdurman, a very major African city, but it's still developed around the tomb of a religious leader. So that's I'll, I'll leave it there in terms of the links with the Sudan. 
that's super 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 powerful and and i and i like the fact that you also pointed out um uh, do, do you mind if i just say gazala or must i put your title in front <laughs> what would you prefer what would you prefer? okay uh, tell us a bit more about this question of, of muslim organization as you described and as captured by by amira and i'm I'm intrigued because I know that you do a lot of work looking at religious-based exclusion. Um, I think for the sake of the audience, maybe just define what does that mean for you? And also how, how, how might we understand it differently to those of us who think that we already understand it? Because there are probably many complex permutations that many people are not fully aware of. Um, I'd love to hear about, you know, how does this play out in neighborhoods, housing, et cetera? Uh, and, and this dichotomy that you describe, and, and what does that mean for the rural condition? If uh, if I if I if I take your statement and put it on its head, you know, so does this mean that exclusion in rural areas so is like different? Um, uh, let's call it uh, pace or or, or uh, intensity. Yeah. Um, well, there are some similarities. So if we look at uh, identity-based segregation uh, and especially residential segregation. Uh, in India, uh, we find that, uh, uh, you know, the social uh, uh, fractures in India are quite deep. So there's, uh, you know, discrimination or uh, problems related to religious uh, communities. But there's also, uh, as, uh, you know, most of you would know about uh, the caste system in India. So this is uh, by and large a Hindu uh, institution, but because of India's complex uh, history, it's also something that has been then adopted into other religious identities and uh, uh, Muslims and Sikhs and Christians are also known to practice some form of caste system uh, among themselves. So all, in terms of special segregation, there is, segregation based on class, of course, we all understand that pretty well, but then there's segregation based on caste identities and there's segregation based on religious identities. Now, the, the, um, the fact of segregation based on religious identity actually becomes even more complex because of the history of colonialism in India and the specific fact, historical fact of partition of India uh, uh, into uh, you know Pakistan and India first, and then later uh, the partition of uh, uh, Pakistan uh, into Pakistan and Bangladesh. So the regional uh, uh, you know politics is actually also based on uh, uh, you know linguistic, ethnic, and religious uh, identities, and because uh, it, Bangladesh and Pakistan by and large based on um, uh, you know, uh, uh, religious identity. And the idea was that Pakistan uh, was supposed to be a uh, homeland for Muslims in the region, whereas India actually remained uh, a, a secular country. And you know, it, 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 there was no uh, sort of official policy of ejecting all Muslims. So a large number of Muslims continued to live in India but they are burdened by the history of partition. So the Muslim neighborhoods in India also have the burden and the pejorative labeling of being mini Pakistans in India. Uh, so, so therefore, you know, they are not invested in the idea of India so much. Their national, you know, the, the feeling of nationalism or patriotism and love for their country is always under question. So the so although uh, to to just sum it up, although there is residential segregation and housing discrimination faced by many other groups and communities, the segregation of Muslims in India is way more complicated and uh, uh, and uh, you know sort of fraught with different kind of dangers and uh, and uh, uh, you know issues related to. Uh, life and liberty and economic rights uh, as well, uh, uh, you know, and not just uh, uh, sort of uh, issues of only inequity. Super powerful. Super powerful. Um, so many, so many ways that I'd love to, to weave your different experiences together. But I think just to start out with that, uh, let's let's still keep them um, uh, somewhat separate. 
in terms of in terms of the, the city, and, I, and I'm just um, backing onto your point, Gazda. Do you find that uh, certain functions, uh, jobs, uh, are either reserved, either formally or by proxy, due to religion um, or by caste? Are there certain activities where, let's say, the, the city is marked by by certain behaviors that are linked to different people? Uh, would you say that's that's a fair comment or not? I'm just I'm super curious about how people are navigating uh these these um uh these, these categories and, and what are their options yeah so uh, so caste system itself is actually supposed to be based on although i mean because you get born into a caste and you are supposed to die into it there's no way you can get rid of your caste uh that's how the system works so uh, but but uh, in another way it is supposed to be based on occupational differences and so, uh, so it is true that uh, a lot, of, and especially you know, the most disfavored jobs, or you know, the unclean jobs, or jobs that are not desirable, that don't pay very well, require much more hardship. Those are the jobs that that get kind of reserved for uh, you know people belonging to certain communities. Although there is some uh, affirmative action as well. And there is reservation, official reservation, uh, for uh, uh, what is called scheduled caste and scheduled tribes and other backward caste. It's all, you know, caste based. Uh, in public, uh, uh, you know, uh, employment, uh, public sector employment, and also uh, public universities for only higher education and not school education. So, uh, so it's the, you know all of this basically pans out in a very uh, discriminatory way for uh, different populations. Uh, in my work, I, I mean, I I don't want to take a lot of time, uh, you know, explaining this, but let me just say that in my work, I also found out that uh, residential segregation as well as any other form of identity based special segregation, especially in the cities, was actually another form of labor market segregations. So people belonging to different strata in society, uh, doing different kinds of jobs, uh, are sort of incarcerated into different areas. And it's their identities as well as their special location that made it difficult for them to have any kind of social, economic, and occupational mobilities into uh, different uh, market segments. Very, very powerful, very powerful. Um, and, and I think that opens up a, a conversation um, with Kira. Kira, the, the work that you're doing currently right now, uh, you just mentioned this, uh, this competition where uh, you're looking at, uh, you know, different forms of participation, community level, it is about design. But on this piece about labor practice and how maybe how the city is produced or co-produced by actors, um, your, your work tends to intersect in that space, uh, uh, Kira, um, from a developmental perspective. What, what are your thoughts based on what um, Gazales just said? I think the question that you just asked on co-production is really important. So Gazala was also focused also on the kind of material physical dimension of um, spatial inequity um, and division. What our work is also focused on is not just social inclusion or material um, uh, inclusion, but also, you know, ensuring that the voice of people are also included. So looking at lack of agency or voice in the way in which we plan with communities is also critical to um, a successful outcome. So the AKDN since the 1980s has created these governance structures in villages especially where we have equal male and female representation when we're looking to create a new area or building um, or even describe vulnerability, hazard vulnerability risk assessments. These are GIS data that we then explain to um, the village. And now they can read spatial maps, aerial photography. 
um, I, you know, when I went in to Tajikistan in some of these villages, they're very comfortable with um, some satellite imagery. So I think that we need to look at the whole spectrum of what social exclusion does in terms of planning with, planning for um, w the community, whether that's at a village scale or in an urban scale. Um, so for us at the agency, that's been um, a real focal point in terms of our projects. Brilliant. Uh, sorry, let me just switch on. Uh, uh, Shruti, um, uh, yeah, what, what, what are your thoughts? I, I actually <laughs> had a question for you, Mokena, before we oh, carry shoot. on, yeah. right? Sure. So, you know, like when you shared your example, you spoke about the colonial sort of... Uh, nature of South Africa. And as Ghazala was speaking, right, I could see a lot of like, our countries have similar experiences, right, over the years. How do you think, like what has changed in South Africa or not, right, with regards to identity linked exclusion? And what continues to remain? Like, I would love to understand that from you. It's a it's a very complicated question, and 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 I'm sure that uh, many South Africans will probably disagree with what I'm about to say. Uh, but you know, if we if we look at South Africa at a systemic level, it's made a number of incredible strides for inclusivity. You know, whether it uh, whether in terms of I think the first country to actually you know ab absolutely acknowledge uh, marriage, um, irrespective of of uh, of gender orientation, um, you know, um, at the same time, we also ha have pretty good religious freedom in terms of a practice of religion and faith. Uh, our, our cities have a high degree of fluidity at that sort of level. But then at the same time, um, there are, of course, the spatial conditions which are very resilient and continue to perpetuate the, the racial um, inequalities and those racial inequalities play themselves out as um, as structural economic barriers, right? So, so we sit in a country of contradictions. In some respects, our constitution is seen as one of the most progressive in the world around some of these issues of inclusion. You know, whether it's for less abled people, etc. Um, so, there's definitely a strong attempt to to walk the the talk, if you will. But where it starts getting really difficult are the, those hard, expensive infrastructure decisions around how do our townships work, um, you know, the distribution of schools uh, in relation to certain populations, you know, access to greenery. You know, if you were to measure a typical South African township and say how many trees per capita are there compared to some of our leafier suburbs, you'd have some very shocking statistics. And we are. Um, as of 2016, I think we have, we've always we've been the, the most unequal country in the world, um, you know, uh, across a whole range of, 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 of metrices and metric points, right? So, so on the one hand, I'm torn because I do want to acknowledge that we are a country that is aware of it. We are a country that struggles with it. So we're, we're engaged in a, in a struggle, we're not in denial around, about our problems. Uh, which is of the first step, because some countries don't even admit they have a problem, right? <laughs> some very big and wealthy countries. But, uh, you know, so, so we know we've got a problem, but it doesn't mean that knowing it means that you have the solution. And that's where South Africa finds itself. And, and, and a big subtext to our racial um, strife, if you will, is that on the one hand, we recognize the importance of redress and providing housing and all of this stuff, you know. At the same time, South Africa still wants to be seen as a, a credible and mature democracy that respects um, property rights, that respects freedom of enterprise, you know, and so on. So we struggle with affirmative action and, um, you know, Black economic empowerment and the different ways that it works. And we oscillate between people saying it, we get rid of it and others saying we need it. I mean, I'm, I'm very upfront in saying I'm a product of, of a Black economic empowerment. I would not have been I would not have become an architect had it not been for somebody's sincere efforts to say we need more black people studying this discipline. So, I, so I will, I'll tell you upfront, I, I believe in, in positive affirmation um, and, that it, that it, and that it can make a difference. But uh, we are very much um, 
an incomplete experiment um, in South Africa. Our, our democracy continues to be challenged. And just recently, um, some of you may watch this and may not know, we had probably the biggest threat to our democracy since the advent of democracy, where for all intents and purposes, we probably narrowly avoided a, a, a coup d'etat. Some would argue with me that it wasn't. But that, that moment, the seven odd days of looting in our capital cities was partly, uh, all evidence seems to be partly orchestrated, but at the same time also just genuine frustrations of people on the ground who, who literally just ran to nearby grocery stores for food, you know. And I remember listening on the radio to a policeman who was uh, recovering some of these goods. And they came to one house and uh, the elderly woman in the house said, if you take this food from us, we have nothing to eat. Now that's a very, very difficult proposition to be in because they're stolen goods, right? Obviously the state wants to be seen to be respecting the rights of the shop owners who've lost their goods. But here's this person who's not stealing for, for pure joy or, or anarchy, but literally just said, we won't have any food. So that, that's the story of South Africa. We, we're, we're very much, um, you know, engaged, engaged in an, on, an ongoing struggle of self. Uh, we, we have these lofty ideas about how we should be inclusive, but uh, we've got a long way to go. I, I, I would actually love to, to, to throw that back to you, Shruti, not, 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 but not, not, not right now, maybe first to Amira, but then back to you, because Amira is also a South African. I mean, I'd love yeah. her take on where we are on the, on the inclusivity spectrum, you know, um, and then I'd like to hear from your experience too. Yeah. Sure. Sure. yeah. Wonderful. So should I go ahead? Yes, please. Go ahead, Amira. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. So, so thank you so much, Mokena, for that. Uh, so much uh, things to reflect on. So I wrote an article with the recent riots that I titled Crisis is an Opportunity to Heal from Divisive Spatial Geographies. And I really linked a lot of that anger and, and a breakdown of systems to the way that uh, the South African city is structured to disadvantage, it's structured to humiliate. And um, so, so uh, yeah, uh, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd love it if people uh, visit that article. Um, South Africa, yes, like Mokena says, we've been trying to fix a lot of the ills. They are acknowledged. I think our policy, uh, Mokena, is quite advanced. Our constitution is definitely very advanced. Our policies are very advanced. If one reads all of the guideline documents in terms of giving opportunity and making things more equitable, we are doing very well in terms of paper. But in, in terms of actually translating that into doable, actionable, you know, we need political will. Uh, we need our strategies to truly be pro-poor, which uh, many times we say, but we don't really do. So South Africa, after, um, um, you know, into democracy, did really well in terms of the numbers of houses provided, as an example. But they very quickly realized about 10 years into providing houses that, uh, the, that it was not really transforming the city. So uh, one thing that I often mention is that what are the measures of success in housing? And for me, the measures in success would be ease of access. It would be improved economic conditions. It would be better health. It would be better education. But you can't have your measure of success as being we've provided a million houses. That that's, uh, doesn't really tell you about how it's changed people's lives. Um, so, so again, coming to this comparison between Sudan and South Africa and the different forms of exclusion that happen in both, I find uh, a, a term that uh, a colleague many years ago um, used was formal vandalism. There's always this very uh, uncomfortable relationship between the activities of people in the city and governments. So, so, go so local governments withhold services and they withhold support from, uh, for what I believe to be very legitimate activities in the city. 
And all of this, uh, I think, uh, you know, and when we're talking about exclusion, I've often referred to South African cities as being disabling cities. So now, if, if, if you are someone with some form of disability or some other disadvantage, you're further disabled by the structure of these cities. Um, and and uh, a couple of, of, of other points. In Sudan, up until today, we still use the terms first class neighborhood, second class neighborhood, third class neighborhood. There's restrictions in terms of the building materials in the different classes. It's inherited from British colonialism. It discriminates against alternative building materials or traditional building materials. It's a terrible system, but we still use it and it discriminates uh, against a lot in the population. So I'd like to finish just with, um, with this term lovability in the built environment, Mokena. And, I, and it relates a, a, a lot to what we were all saying. Um, in the sense that for me, uh, lovability uh, uh, or a lovable built environment is an environment that resonates with many over many years. And it's produced by many. And so it's a totally different way of decision making in the built environment. And um, I, I, I'm very conscious of what Kira is saying regarding data and technology. And for me, if, if you uh, take that quality of lovability and resonance with many over many years, it implies that your approach to technical decision making and your approach to design decision making is very different if you do it in that way. Um, so so that, that would be an opportunity for a longer engagement and a longer conversation, but I think I'll leave it there. I mean, I love the phrase, the lovable cities. Like, I feel it's so much more um, compassionate <laughs> as well as like reflective of where we want our cities to be, right? Um, I actually wanted to build on some of the themes that you were touching. And when we ask Kira, like, ask you to maybe talk a little bit more about this whole concept that Amira is talking about of building together. Right and like giving that love and building the cities together. You 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 touched on that, Kira, like how you are thinking about community engagement. But is that seen as a pathway for trying to address some of these issues that we are seeing? And are there any examples of success, uh, even moderate so that you've seen, Kira? Thank you so much, Amira and Shruti, um, and. Yes, the lovable cities is a great phrase. Um, and an area produced by many is definitely also owned and maintained by many and your sense of identity and connection is there as well. So for, I think for the experience of our organization or our agency, um, we also, or one of the key issues is how do you scale the quality of urban design or urban planning? How do you ensure there's quality there? And for us, the ethical underpinning is participatory planning. It has to be demand-driven participatory planning. A lot, it's easier, it's faster to do a top-down approach of just having no inclusion of participants and just doing whatever it needs to be done from the government's perspective. Um, a kind of technocratic top-down approach. But we're really ensuring that our processes also reflect the fact that we have to have a community and a participatory planning process to be there. In some of the regions that we work, as I mentioned before, there's already these systems in place. So it makes it easier in a way to enter some of the villages. So for example, we're working in Basid with MIT. That project is now at the Venice Biennale. Um, and that was where I was bringing in more of a, an academic approach to participatory planning at a village that was very high risk of multi-hazards, which is only enhanced by climate change. So there the community actually came to our agency and said, we wish to move because we understand the fact that we're in a very dangerous zone. 
So not only is it participatory planning, but it's demand driven where we're being asked to enter, which is a, a very different dynamic from the get go. And then we ensure through surveys, through um, observation to, to do that. And we had drone imagery, topograph topographical analysis of the region they wanted to move to, as well as an analysis of the current village layout. How are they using the space? How are they, where are the animal and livestock? How are they using water? How is, um, how are they clustered currently? And what are those dynamics if they were to move? So that was one exercise we did with participatory planning. We're also doing it now in Khorog, which is the highest city in Tajikistan. And the infrastructure there is dating from the 1970s. So a lot of water sanitation systems, a lot of critical infrastructure has to be rehauled. We're working hand in hand with the UN Habitat and their urban labs. And so our techniques and technology are complementary. So this question of how do you scale high quality urban design and urban planning while including the voice of our population and the communities that we serve, for me, it comes out to what's a scalable method. So we created at the Aga Khan Agency for Habitat, a very flexible method for non-planners as well to do urban design and urban planning, which we're calling the Habitat Planning Framework. And this is a, a means so that our staff members can also undertake planning concepts and do it step by step. And obviously urban design and urban planning is not always linear in nature, but there are certain milestones you have to hit. And those two ethical underpinnings are inclusive participatory planning, um, and that we also work very closely with the government so that it is that we're not taking the place of government right? Because urban design and planning really should come from there, but that we're also doing capacity building and doing it hand in hand with their vision as well. So I think it's creating, you know, my focus, as I mentioned that at the very beginning, is how to create scalable impact. And some of that is with methodology, some of it is with data-driven processes. And another one is inculcating, you can't move forward unless at all stages of the planning process, we're including the vision and the voice of the community. And it's not just at one point, it's also during building process. And, and later on, are they happy with the way it's happened? How are the, how are the houses being allocated? So for us, it's, it's also about methods um, and data to ensure the quali you know, quality assurance as we go forward. Uh, as we scale urban design and planning in our regions. I hope it's that answers super the question. inspiring, Kira. And I can just like imagine this process running and also sort of would love to understand that framework that you mentioned separately. Um, I guess what you've covered, Kira, is very powerful in terms of including the citizen's voice and representation in this entire process and making those lovable cities. But there has to be a role that our policymakers our public bodies need to take on, right? So, so maybe Kazala, can I ask you this question? And, and looking also, you should feel free, like from your very deep urban experience to chime in. Are you seeing any action uh, on the positive front, you know, from the public side, the public policy government, on improving uh, resource allocation, making it more fair and equitable? Like, are you seeing? And are there any examples again where you think these are going well? I'd love to hear that. Is there anything from your side on that? Uh, no, uh, you know, unfortunately, <laughs> I would have loved to say yes, and there are some examples, but I, I mean, uh, especially in India today and the kind of, uh, you know, uh, the regime that we have, uh, there is, and which was also made very, very visible during the recent uh, COVID-19 crisis, uh, uh, early earlier this year in uh, you know April and May we had a very uh, devastating uh, second wave and we saw how our health infrastructure just completely collapsed. Uh, not only that in rural areas it didn't really exist in the first place, but in the urban areas where we did have you know 
uh, some level of uh, health facilities. It just completely collapsed uh, uh, earlier. You know, there were questions of inequity uh, in the face of COVID. We know that it's not only inequitable, but it's also completely and grossly insufficient for the needs of a population such as ours in a situation like this. So, so yeah, we have, we have seen not only no political will, but we have seen complete callousness uh, to, to uh, respond to some of these questions. Uh, but, but if one were to look at, uh, you know, uh, not so recent history, and even before uh, the COVID, uh, you know, harsh lockdowns and the, uh, you know, the waves of death and devastation owing to it, uh, in terms of, you know, how our cities are structured, I feel that uh, there's really, you know, no, um, uh, you know, no effort to have policy which is not based only on common sense and prejudices. Uh, that's the sad state of uh, affairs in India. And we, uh, and those tendencies have always been there, but they've really intensified in the last uh, uh, six, seven to eight years. Uh, so we have policy making on some of these issues, uh, inequity, injustice, uh, uh, and, and the uh, kind of drivers of urbanization in India. Um, for example, if you look at some, something like uh, uh, the you know, sudden and complete demonetization that we saw a few years ago, and it just killed the informal sector in India. It killed so many jobs, the economic activity, and the impact that it had on people's lives um, uh, was, was also devastating. So we've seen waves and waves of really bad, callous, uh, horrific policy making actually in India uh, very recently. And I, I would just like to, you know, pick up on two points that uh, uh, Amira and Kira have made. Uh, the idea about, you know, how this idea that we've had so many houses made and uh, made, made available in the market. And even when they are bought uh, in Delhi, for example, which is where most of my work is situated, we have in the you know in the outskirts of the city we have uh, swaths of uh, you know areas where we have developed areas where there are flats and these are mostly uh, housing for upper middle class or upper classes in India and most of these people have bought houses for investment purposes and they are not for many years and even over a decade or more. Uh, a large amount of housing that is good quality housing is just sitting idle without anybody actually living in them. So, so just a perfect example of what you said, you know, just that housing is there and it has been made available. So it's been bought by people who have the resources, but they're not the ones who actually need the housing. Uh, and so it does nothing to... Uh, to the way uh, people dwell in the city. And also uh, th this idea that, you know, common sense drives and common sense is often also prejudiced, also biased, uh, this sort of policy making. Um, uh, in Delhi, especially, we've, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I as, a, as a common citizen, I have yet to see any serious effort in which people's lived experiences and dynamic, you know, changing lived experiences are actually taken on in this policy making, uh, uh, the, the issue of policy making. So, uh, for example, you know, uh, uh, Jamia Nagar, where this is the Muslim neighborhood where I live myself, there are a lot of people, a lot of women who live in uh, families who live in uh, very small uh, dwelling units, flats that are chock a block with each other. There's very poor light lighting, uh, literally no ventilation. And these are people who have actually come from uh, smaller cities or rural areas where they have, you know, some amount of land. They have housing that's, you know, much better quality. But if you talk to some of these women, as I have in, uh, you know, my PhD and uh, the book, 
uh, some of them actually would clearly say that they prefer living in cities and in these badly ventilated, badly lighted houses because of the opportunities that are just not available in the rural areas. Uh, and not only uh, economic opportunities, but also just uh, this, uh, I'm just picking up on the thread of lovable cities where you know you kind of live lives uh, where it's possible to um, you know, uh, attain a full humanity. You can, uh, uh, you know, bring up families and love each other and uh, live a freer life, uh, freer from the shackles of traditions, from the usual, uh, you know, prejudices based on caste and uh, class uh, and a religious identity lines. So, so they said, no, 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 we don't want to go back to those areas. We, we are more free here, even though the house is not so nice, but, you know, we can go out in Bombay, you know, they'd say, well, you know, even if my house is terrible, but I could, whenever I want, I can go and sit on the, uh, you know, next to the sea and what, look at the ocean, there's wind, uh, there's freedom, basically, uh, to, to uh, or at least a hope that one could, you know, reach one's full uh, potential as a human being. So, uh, so uh, the way uh, uh, you know, professionals, planning uh, professionals would envision city and think of how, which are the spaces that are actually allowing people to uh, to experience uh, life in a certain manner. It might actually differ from the way people actually experience it. But yes, you know, I mean. Uh, not only evidence in terms of data, but evidence in terms of people's aspirations and their, um, you know, experiences of space. That's something that's completely uh, absent from policy making. It's uh, yeah. I can relate to a lot of this, and I sort of feel sad about it. Kira, you, know, you had your hand up. Do 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 you want to ask add something? Oh, me me or can also. I, I oh, yeah. Kira also had a hand up before you, Mukena. So maybe if Kira, That's you want to go, and then Mukena can go. Yeah. Sorry, no. <laughs> I'm all set. All righty. Okay. Mukena, go for it. So I, I'm loving this part of the conversation, but I do want to pivot us in a slightly different direction. And, I, and I'm welcome to be course corrected if, if either of you feel differently. Uh, and I'll tell you why, why I'm doing this. Um, in 2012, I had the fortune to go and uh, engage with some planning officials in Cairo. And it was remarkable, uh, A, we were discussing the vision for Cairo, which was another body of work, uh, which I won't get into right now, but talking to the civil engineer who literally was unable to tell us what was the population of Cairo, Partly justified because given the sheer size of the city, depending on traffic flows in and out of the city, you're looking at a sort of deviation of, of 4 million people. Mm -hmm. So it's either 22 million or 26 million, depending on the time of day. But I raise that point because one of the, one of the things that came out of our discussion um, was the question about how do we plan for cities and, and can we plan? And do we have the capacity to enact on those plans? And what I, what I mean by that is that it's one thing to get the professionals to have the right attitude. It's nothing to have states and policymakers to have the right attitude. But I would argue that in, in many parts of the global South, it's not even a mad, matter of, of, you know, is it the right idea or the wrong idea? It's just, it just isn't capacity, right? So a lot of our urban environments, some of them have resources that need to be redirected. In others, there's this question about, you know, city planning in a traditional frame, you know, does, does it, is it actually meaningful in many of these places? Do these planning officials have the capital to support the policy decisions that they make? Do they have the political will to give agency to their sorts of ideas? Um, and, and lastly, if we, if, we, if we assume that, let's say, half of those are, are unable to, to meet the, the, you know, the sort of aspirations as described in this room, then what is the role of the private sector? And what is the role of NGOs? And, 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 and Kira, I'm sure you've got lots to say on this, but I do want to broaden it. You know? So what is, what is the role of ordinary citizens? You know, uh, maybe Amira, you can talk about that because I do think that the, the old model where planners could 
develop a position paper, do the design, do everything right, and then be able to execute on it is probably mm -hmm. long, long, long gone, you know. So the question is, how do we, how do we make, how do we co-produce our cities in a context where planning is no longer about the planner with a great vision, a good drawing, and a benevolent plan? I, I, I would argue that for some, the, the, you know, that's just not possible. We, you know, I, I know many cities where there's not even, even the notion of a town planner is not even, they're nowhere on the radar within the, the government um, ecosystem. So, so that's my provocation, which is what can we do in our various spaces? How can we bring private sector in? How can we bring corporates? How can we bring NGOs? How can we co-produce co the city in the context of where maybe planning in its traditional um, guise is, is unable, even with the best of intentions, is unable to, to, to meet the task? And, that, and that's to the floor, by the way. Yeah. May, 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 I, may I go there, if at all possible? I, I, I'm open. <laughs> okay, open. Yeah. wonderful. No, I, I have so much to say, so I'll have to keep it very brief. Yeah. Um, uh, Kira, I really, I think uh, uh, the work you do may be at different scales and different contexts, but it's very similar to my concerns with regards to community engagement projects that I'm involved in. And this issue around uh, what uh, an architect in South Africa had called the politically motivated need for speed and that it needs to be a slower consultative process and then you're looking at these issues of what, uh, how it can become scalable um, and, and, and the issue of demand-driven participation. But the way that you're speaking about it, and, I, and I'll actually ask this to you as a question, which you, you know, maybe Mokena will give you a chance to respond to that, is um, that it, 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 it seems to be uh, quite a set process. And my experience has been very messy. And, and, and in the sense that when you go into different communities, there's different dynamics and different issues. And, and, and there's a messiness uh, to the process. And Nabil Hamdi says we need to engage with that messiness. So I'm very curious about that. And, um, and uh, Ghazala puts it in a different way where she says that people have very dynamic living experiences. And that's also my experience, Vazala, in, in that, uh, and, and I think when I spoke about the pivotal events in my life earlier, um, it was around engaging with that mess. The way I was taught was uh, you have a fixed site, you have a fixed, um, uh, you know, client and everything is like very neat and goes in stages. And then, and, and, and that was the pivotal career kind of tran um, transformation in my understanding of what architecture is and what design is. And I think Mokena then asks, how do we do design? And, 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 and that's why for me that uh, translating that concept of lovability, it has very practical, technical design-based methods, because I find that if you uh, engage with the community today, and that brings us back to what um, Razala was saying about the dynamic experiences. If I engage with a community today around a table, ask what their needs are, their needs change tomorrow, their needs are dynamic. So how do I design for that uncertainty? How do I design for an unknown future? So for me, lovability, and there's definitely no opportunity here to discuss this in, in more detail, but lovability translates into very clear decision-making processes and methods in design and, and, and technical resolution. Um, and, and it's all about designing for the unknown. It's all about addressing um, Ghazala, the dynamic living experiences. And we have exactly the same, a very different context, but exactly the same, where people are given for free government subsidized housing or for a nominal fee, 
um, and, and they leave them, they say they have a house, but they go and live elsewhere because it's closer to job opportunities. And I love the fact, Razala, that you're pointing it out that there are many other reasons why people want to be in these denser urban contexts in addition to the job opportunities. Um, but but uh, the, the thing that I really wanted to point out is that um, participation um, uh, can only happen if we acknowledge the very dynamic changing requirements of communities sitting around the table and consulting with people. Uh, I think is great, it's important, but it's not the only way to ensure that the, that the environment we build and we design is relevant for many, many years to come, for many generations to come. And that's what I mean by lovability. Oh, can I say a final point? Very final point. Interesting statistics from South Africa from a few years back. People in rural areas in South Africa are generally reliant on government grants. People in, 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 in urban informal settlements are generally, either they have their own businesses or they are salaried people. I find that statistic very powerful. Thank you. It's powerful indeed. Powerful indeed. Powerful indeed. Uh, Sinjana, I mean, you, you brought us together here, um, but we haven't heard from you since you started the session. <laughs> how, how, how is this resonating with, um, and, and of course, I'm not, I'm not curtailing uh, your, your flow, Amira uh, uh, and, and Kira. I just wanted to recognize Sinjana and also just reiterate that she's also welcome to join the conversation. I think your, your mic is off. Yeah, thanks for checking in. That's really beautiful. Um, I'm just here to sort of listen in and um, uh, learn a lot from the wonderful panelists here. So, um, and this is not my field of expertise, but just happy to be here and uh, sort of take in through the entire learning process. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now I was wondering, like, Kia, yeah, would you like to respond to the question that Amira posed. Um, yeah. yeah, I would love to hear that. Yeah, so well, what, was what was the question? Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> there were two questions I heard. So Amira, I, I loved the, the question of messiness and the, the chaos of planning. And obviously the cultural context, the scale of the project, uh, what does the initiative need? Is it affordable housing? Is it transit? Is it uh, environmental sustainability, obviously the planning project and um, the key need of that area, it will obviously depend on that. So there's this tension between quality assurance and having systems in place. So, you know, stakeholder mapping, design charrettes, different participatory um, elements ensuring a, a certain percent of women participating. So these are key milestones Yet the, the order in which you do it, the focus of the planning initiatives is different. So we're always playing with that tension, with that real tension. So even the system, the habitat planning framework, it's a framework, but within which you can play. But some elements can be or should be fixed. So one of them I would say, and I think this is to Mukena's point um, that he started with, with how do you work with government or the private sector? I also believe in data processes, like what kind of data are we collecting qualitatively or quantitatively? And I think that determines the outcome also of the planning project. So some of those data points are fixed, you know, um, building typologies or, you know, the topography in which you're working in or soil types. And other ones can be shifted based on the, the planning process. So to Mukena's point about how the private sector and government can be engaged, it's also ensuring that the data they're pulling is inclusive. And the data they're pulling is not only certain quantitative nature. So for example, what are the what's vernacular architecture for that region? What's the kind of 
um, typology, like we have Pamiri housing, which is seismically resilient and also has the reflection of Muslim identity. Each pillar in the house reflects um, a different, you know, religious leader. The, the strongest one is, is uh, the Prophet Muhammad. So I think looking at what you're collecting, what you're not, is both ensuring inclusivity in different ways, but also a means for scaling. And so what we're working on right now is a pilot of what we're calling habitat assessment. We are pulling from um, UN data, so the FAO, so looking at soil typology, pulling from NASA data and EU Sentinel data, because all of it is there. It's amazing satellite imagery, but it's really about processing that data and then making it accessible for planners or people who are going to plan the city or plan the region. So I think for us, it's also about data access accessibility um, and not just having, you know, as planners, we all love ArcGIS, <laughs> but a lot of people are not trained on ArcGIS. So again, how do you democratize data access for government officials? And that's very important for us. So. Um, to Amira's point, messiness is important, but some elements, you know, are, are ways to measure quality assurance, um, as well as the data that you collect. And that's where private sector and government in terms of building capacity with and for them is, uh, is I think, critical to that question. But it is an interesting tension between scalability and specificity, which will always exist. Indeed, indeed, indeed. I'll, 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 I'll try and I'll build on that point, um, Kira, as well as your, your provocation, uh, Amira. Um, and, and do alert me if I haven't asked the question properly. <laughs> uh, I, I think the question of messiness is something that I, I entirely embrace. And I, 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 I think I've been fairly fortunate to kind of reflect that in some of my work. And I'll maybe give some examples. Um, I think of I think of Cape Town Station, right? Uh, very politically charged uh, product uh, or project, rather. Uh, and there were 352 informal traders uh, who occupied a large public plaza in front of the building. And you know the client wanted me to get rid of them. Um, you could almost describe as you know the, the the tension between designing a railway station, which is about trains being on time and movement and structure and engineering and flows um, juxtaposed against informal traders who are obviously there because of the confluence that, that emerges from people coming off the trains and, and buying goods, but then reconciling that sort of messy condition, if you will, because uh, those traders were in a very uncomfortable relationship with, uh, with the landowner. And a couple of things along the way. The one is, you know, I held a, a, a public participation process, probably not as pristine or as structured as, as I would have liked uh, in hindsight, but I, I remember printing a, a map of, of the station. Um, I think it must have been six meters long, <laughs> by about two and a half meters wide. And I showed all of the traders where they're currently located. So they literally walked on a giant map. And then I showed them where they could be. Um, and I managed, and this had, this had been, they, we were unable, to, for years, they've been unable to engage in a, in a, in a public, in a, in a discourse with the informal traders. But um, through that process of engagement, where they could literally imagine um, where they could be and started to negotiate and reimagine uh, their new location, um, you know, a, a, a messy condition produced a messy design process because it was not entirely exact, but then it also produced a very precise outcome because then the traders moved and so on. I was able to make plans around it. I, I, I look back at that process and I must admit that it, it, there were still constraints. It was still a railway station, right? And Amira, it, it was still a site. I had boundaries. It wasn't free, freely fluid. I had to, I had to be an enabling uh, designer in that conversation. There had to be an exchange of skills. I had to give them advice about optimal sizes and escape routes and fire paths and things to think about, you know, and, and also how to zone themselves uh, uh, from, from a trading perspective so that you begin to have like a clothing section and a, 
So, so you, you, your point right to the beginning, Amira, about an exchange of skills in, in uh, I would add, in messy contexts, I think is quite an important one. Um, and I think it also ties to your point, Kira, about quality control, because at the end of the day, I've, I've seen public participation processes where experts abrogate their duty and, and just leave the people to just, you know, sketch, say, do whatever they want. And, and it has been problematic. Um, and in fact, I, I often think that that's a denial and almost disrespectful of, of, of the nature of engagement when professionals don't, uh, don't bring their knowledge to the table in a spirit of exchange, but just put their hands up and say, that's what the community want. Um, and I can tell you of, of one particular project, Amira knows the building quite well. Actually, I think she was a judge on it, uh, an architectural project where I was always frustrated by the brief. Um, a, a soft drink company, which I will not mention since this might go out, um, went on a campaign to get um, young black South Africans into basketball and move them away from soccer. So this huge campaign uh, had a great marketing effect and it was super popular. And uh, the client then said, well, why don't you create a, you know, a basketball court for the community? Um, then I said, well, you know, I, I, we, Basketball is not really a common sport in, in the townships. And then they said, but that's what that's what came out in the public participation process. They said they want to play basketball. And, and I tried to explain to the client that this is a sort of market-driven immediate response. To your point, Amira, I mean, that, 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 that moment where someone says they want something, which is not necessarily what they might want tomorrow or for future generations. But I, but you know, I, you know I, I had no agency at the time and, and I designed a basketball, an indoor basketball court facility um, on the back of that. Thankfully, it was, it, 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 you know, I managed to morph it into a multi-purpose center. So the facility does a range of things now and people play judo and if, um, weddings and political events, et cetera. But the brief started out almost as a sort of flawed public yeah. participation process where the, you know, uh, had I not been a bit more, careful i would have created a pure basketball court and so on because because of this marketing campaign by this this um, global force that was able to get very famous people playing basketball and getting get, getting you know cha basically changing behavior so so there is something to be said a about the messiness of of sight of desire of of issues but i do think that there's also something to be said about we, we mustn't leave our wisdom at the, at the door when we walk into a, a room for public participation. And sometimes that wisdom is about very practical things. Um, you know, the alignment of a, of a sewer line perhaps or, or topography or soil conditions, those data points that you mentioned, Kira. And some of them are much harder to, to pin down, but they're just as relevant, you know. So understanding waves of sentiment which might be distorting uh, uh, you know, um, issues at the time. I mean, if you if you do public participation in a community that's going through uh, a period of, of particular violence, you, you can find that the outputs and what's being asked for respond to those conditions in, a, in quite a distinct way, or if you find that there's no water and so on. So, so you have to take all of these, these, these data points on board um, and respect them and give them the space that's, 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 that's due to them. But I think it's also super important to, to still be present, right? To still be thoughtful, to still be a designer, to still have foresight. And, and I like your provocation, Amira, about this question of time, right? Uh, I'm going to close off just now because I'm saying too much. But on a, on a, on a, on a dissimilar project, um, you know, a client was talking to me about a, a particular technology that they wanted to, dis to deploy in this um, urban framework. And I said to them, I, I don't really care about the technology. And they were quite taken aback because they thought that was the whole purpose. I said, my job as the urban planner is to design spaces that will be amazing and functional, whether, you know, when the technology changes. And if you can think of London, you know, whether the city ran on, on water power or steam or electricity or nuclear, the urban form endures. So my, my role is to be thoughtful across time to create urban form and urban spaces that technology can change. We can move from, from horse to cart to hoverboard <laughs> to, to, to subway. 
but the, the, the urban form needs to, needs to endure. And I think having that judgment about knowing what is, what is a decision in the moment versus what is a, a decision in perpetuity um, uh, is something that I think is very, very important. Mm -hmm. And I think empathy is a big part of that. If you don't have empathy for future users, uh, you can make lots of mistakes in the present. So, but, I, but I'm not sure if I've answered uh, the, the two questions, Shruti, but that, that would be my response about messiness. Like I don't, I enjoy messiness, but I, but I don't, I don't wallow in it. Like I do think part of our job is to, is to, is to find the beauty in the messiness and to see if it can, you know, help generations and so on. Um, but yeah, I yield. Thank you, Mukena, and very insightful comments. Um, Amir, I, I, I saw your hand up. Would you like to add anything? Yeah, yes, yes. I, I think I'm being very, I'm being very cryptic. So, so I need to, <laughs> I need to try and explain my concepts, maybe, uh, hopefully, and that's, uh, I'm hoping to engage with Mokena more and more, and he'll help me translate my ideas into uh, or, or to say them in a way that's more accessible. So, so just around this issue of engaging with the messiness. Sure. Uh, the, messiness the messiness I'm not celebrating as such, I just think it's there. So I engage with it. <laughs> um, and for me, it's a way for inclusion. So when I sit around with the uh, community members and we're working on a housing project, and the mothers say they want this and the children say they want that and uh, you know the whatever kind of comes out of that engagement a couple of years later someone might be in a car accident so their so their residence needs to be adapted because they are no longer as mobile as they were someone has mm. lost a salary Mm -hmm. So they need to perhaps subdivide their house. Someone has gained a salary, they need to expand their house. Uh, someone has lost a person or had a baby. Um, those are the kind of, that's what I mean by uh, having that initial consultation. To me, I'm very cautious about it because I need to be designing for their circum unknown circumstances five, 10 years from now. I do believe very strongly when I talk about messiness, I believe in, in fixed elements in the, uh, in the built environment and I believe in elements that are not fixed. I believe that whenever we design, and that's why the way I design now is very different to what I was taught in the eighties. Every building, however small, has fixed permanent robust elements to it and elements that can be changed. And that's where, that's where the inhabitants get to transform and change. And, and, but there are other elements which are more aligned to the collective aspirations. So, so the individual aspirations must never conflict with the collective aspirations. And that in a way is a way to manage the messiness. Um, so, yeah, and, and, and Mokena, you and I are so on the same page with regards to withholding of expertise. Um, I, I, I really, you know, a lot of times, especially with a lot of what goes on in informal settlements in South Africa, I'm very upset about this issue, like let the community decide as if we have nothing to offer, but that's where we manage. So, so I believe in an approach to design and planning, which I refer to as system and level separation. And that is what helps us make the design, planning and technical decisions. So, so, so it's engaging with the messiness, it's not making it messy. Let me put it that way. I hope that's explained it a bit. Thank you. I'm completely aligned with you. Completely aligned. <laughs> um, I, I, by the way, I've noticed that um, Kira. Thanks for pointing out. We've got two questions in the in the chat. Um, Shruti, do you want to raise the questions? I'm not sure if they're yeah. directed to anybody in particular. Um, they're not, but I think they're like great questions. Also, there's one thing that I was hoping to cover, which is on what's happened during COVID. Right? Has this inclusion person are they ch new challenges that have come to play in terms of implementing things um 
collecting data, Kira, what you were talking about, right? Like, so basically, so the question, let me just uh, speak out for the benefit of all are, how are the rights of migrants ensured by the cities and the wake of the pandemic, they were worst affected. How can cities do a better job of including them in the policies, right? So, so maybe I can start with uh, Amira, if you wanna sort of you know, talk about that and also feel free to broaden it. The question that I had in my mind is like, what's happened during COVID, right? Has this exclusion only worsened, so. Yeah, the, the, the migrant uh, issue, I mean, in South Africa, we, um, I, and I believe that the recent riots, in addition to all the political issues, and, and the historic uh, socioeconomic spatial issues. I also believe that COVID made it worse because of the loss of jobs, um, the, the lack of access to opportunities, everything just became so much harder for a large uh, portion of the popula population. And unfortunately, then uh, migrant communities get targeted. Um, whenever there's um, in South Africa a perception that there are limited resources, um, uh, levels of xenophobia break out. And that, that's really a tragedy, but um, it's something that needs to be acknowledged. And it does happen. And, and maybe Mokena knows more about that. Um, but that's that's the comment I would make there. Um, Salah, would you yeah. like to add, like, especially, you know, like I can, I know what, like, in India, we really had a real crisis at hand with not managing our migrants in the cities, right? And like some horrifying, horrifying experiences that we've heard and seen. But Gazella, would you like to sort of talk about, right, you know, like we know that the rights were not uh, supported, but are there things cities can do? Well, yeah, I mean, it kind of gives me an opportunity to also, uh, as, a, as a social scientist on this panel, I'm not a planner, I'm not a planning professional. So I think one of the things that I do want to, um, you know, unbundle in this question of messiness is, is also that you know planning practices and policy making are not the only forces that are shaping uh, you know urban uh, spaces and uh, you know urban life, uh, and especially uh, the issue of political economy and politics per se. I mean, uh, a core within that is uh, is electoral politics in India, especially. Uh, I can't say uh, with you know equal confidence about other places, but in India, uh, electoral politics is the main game in the town. Uh, and if you if you get power through uh, uh, electoral politics, especially on um, whether it is on um, you know urban local bodies or uh, it is on um, you know state assemblies, and then of course there is the central government. All of it, you know. It, is, is very much uh, important. And in the recent past, I think, and especially uh, the example or the, the, crisis, the migrant crisis that we saw in the first hard lockdown, we had months of you know, no economic activity. The transmission levels or the infection levels were actually quite low. And uh, we had this lockdown, which was used for you know, very repressive form of governance. Uh, the the uh, ostensibly it was in put in place to actually prepare for the uh, medical and health fallouts, but none of that happened. It it was actually used by the regime to uh, crack down on the undesirables or whoever was their opposition, etc. And in that case, you know, it's actually the politics that also partially created this kind of mess. So it's not that we don't have, um, you know, uh, let's say, for example, we don't have very, you know, powerful laws that pre preserve the interest of uh, migrant workers, or we don't have policies that actually sustain uh, migrant workers' lives in times like this in cities, and they were forced to exit without uh, you know, any, literally no uh, support system to fall back upon. 
and uh, uh, it was in fact uh, uh, you know uh, compared to the crisis of the the movement of human beings across city and state borders was actually compared to the partition of india and the movements of population uh, uh, you know at that point so i think uh, it was not just that you know uh, if we had a better specific policy uh, catering to the needs of migrant workers then maybe you know this sort of thing wouldn't have happened it's actually the larger question of the the let me put it very simply who is in power and who is in power and therefore what is their political will it's not just that they don't have political will to uh, make policy in favor of social justice for certain uh, you know population groups but in fact that they their, their whole uh, you know thrust is to actually um uh, drive further deep uh, you know inequality so the i mean the last point that i want to make is also this uh, this idea that cities are drivers of economy actually but how is this economy being driven it is driven by inequity the profit uh, accumulation happens because there is inequity if people were more equal then uh, you know and and we know this you know historically if we see uh, literature on urbanization and urban uh, 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 you know sort of even infrastructure development all kinds of infrastructure development has ridden on the backs of inequitable uh, resource distribution and then driving some of this uh, resources into urban infrastructure development which is actually something that will not make uh, cities livable nor lovable it will as well only you know prop them up as uh, uh, stage them as some kind of world cities or you know give boost to this sort of nationalist uh, chauvinism uh, uh, of uh, those who are in power so i think um, just to end you know this whole, this idea about what is it that people will say when we actually do some kind of consultations with people is is also that you know while we are we are talking to people people also make an ass, uh, assessment of what is it that we want to hear right and then you know they calibrate their responses so a lot of times in my own you know experience in field work is that you know we we want to probe a little further and come to that point where they feel okay about not telling us what they think we want to hear but you know what is it that they actually want to say so and and a lot of time people will just repeat whatever comes easily to them and whatever can get us off their backs uh, how many times you know i have spoken to rural women in india and they have told me well we are illiterate and we are really stupid and we don't know anything i mean <laughs> obviously one cannot take that at its face value so so i think as social scientists as as planners as people who are interested in uh, you know social justice special justice uh definitely there's something to be said about our ability to read between the lines our ability to have a political economic uh you know uh, analysis and understand what's going on uh, uh really you know what's going on rather than just have these uh, prescriptive solutions or if for example it was migrant workers then if we did you know one two three this then migrant worker situation will be better if it's got to be more comprehensive than that thank you gazala and i think you've like almost got to a place where you've probably summarized like <laughs> the core essence of our discussion today so thank you for doing that i'm just cognizant of time um mukina is it like should we just go around the table and maybe like get like the closing remarks from each of the panelists including yourself i'm happy to add mine to at the end should we go around the table I think I think that's a good idea. I'll I'll keep it brief. I I'll, I really want to say first uh thank you to um the amazing panel for their reflections, sharing personal insights as well as professional um experiences. Highly valuable. I've learned a lot. And and I hope that um we can continue this conversation and and see how we can actually deploy these ideas uh you know with with even more practical effect on the ground. uh my my only closing comment would be to to kind of echo the the last commentary in that um 
on, on the one hand, it's good to understand very specific data points around specific communities that are affected uh, by the city or by urbanization. And, and, I, and I take nothing away from that. So we do need to understand, um, you know, uh, illegally document, oh, sorry, illegal citizens, et cetera, whatever, whatever the terminology might be. We need to understand what are their pain points, what are the issues, what is their access to healthcare during emergencies, what's their access to a whole range of sort of things. But I, but I do want to, to, to support the notion that as much as we hold those very specific data points in, in mind, that we also hold the, the sort of bigger question about more empathetic cities and cities that are, that are, that are, are more just. Uh, we didn't manage to speak much about ecology today and nature. I also think that um, we need to start thinking of nature as an inclusive um, citizen of, of our cities. Um, I also think we need to think about uh, you know, the elderly and the young as a way of, because when you design cities for, for those two constituencies, in many ways, it, it becomes far much more equitable than just, you know, you know. So, so for me, it's partly about understanding very specific data points that need to be addressed um, in a specific time and place, um, but also for to keep the systemic view of how do we make cities better for all people in a way that doesn't um, eradicate those specific minority voices that need to be acknowledged, but at the same time, um, uh, make sure that uh, the bigger picture is not, not forgotten. And that, that's all that I'd say. And I really wanna thank everybody here for their, for their contribution. I also need to uh, depart, um, but thank you, thank you, thank you so much for, for, the, for the sharing. Yeah, and thank you so much, McKenna, for your closing remarks and very heartfelt comments. Um, Amira, would you like to give any closing remarks and then maybe Kira following with you? Yes, th thank you so much, Ruti, and thanks, McKenna. And uh, Kira and Gazala, I've really, uh, yeah, I, I really do appreciate uh, your experiences and everything that you've said a lot of it resonates a lot. So even where I've asked my questions or not so much clarity, it's, it's work that we are all doing and grappling with. So, so I think there's incredible opportunities for future exchanges and knowledge sharing. And, and I really hope that we'll be able to do that. This is one of the uh, most um, interesting panels I've been on and I've been on many. Uh, since lockdown and and this has really uh, the format of it Shruti so well done to you and Mokena and and and, and and of course the the range of the expertise that is here it's something that is really as I said at the beginning very close to my heart um, and Gazala I can see that there's um uh, there's a lot of apprehension perhaps pain around what's happening in India and I'm feeling the same way about my two home countries, uh, Sudan and South Africa, perhaps uh, more um, uh, worry regarding the situation in Sudan, uh, where Sudan, and we're talking about exclusion, where uh, we were excluded for many, many years in a, in a military Muslim condition. And for myself, as, as a, definitely a Muslim and a practicing Muslim, but I don't fit their mold of what a practicing Muslim woman should be. So I have had to face um, uh, forms of exclusion, but um, uh, I, I have uh, other kind of uh, power in other ways. And that played out in horrible ways among many women in the Sudan. Um, so I just wanted Ghazala to share that experience with you and we're going through a political transition now and, and also a lot of worries around what is happening there. And uh, so, so all of this has a lot to do with all forms of, exclu um, uh, of inclusion and exclusion. And I think the good thing about South Africa is we have a constitution that we constantly fall back on. And because Sudan is a state in transition, a lot of these minority groups or, or groups that are considered to be excluded for one or other reasons, we still don't have that very powerful 
umbrella of a progressive constitution to fall back on. I also just want to conclude that I truly do believe that successful cities work for both the rich and the poor and all categories of people. So when we are designing for inclusivity, it means every one of us is benefiting. And, and I don't think people have realized how powerful that is. Thank you so much, Amira. Uh, it's been a real pleasure having you on the panel and you know, especially a lot of the questions that you asked all of us. Kira, any closing remarks from your side? Thank you so much. It's been such an honor and pleasure to be on this panel. And it's almost magical that we can connect over Zoom um, and from all these countries and diverse experiences facing the same challenges and learn from each other. And um, I'm just so humbled to, to also be on this panel with such great women leaders and Mukena's great experience. Um, so thank you for that. And I do hope we continue uh, this exchange. And to those who attended, thank you so much. I'm really open um, to collaborate, especially on ways that people feel they can scale quality planning, even though there's tension in that scalability versus specificity. So if anyone wants to reach out, has ideas, whether that's data driven, whether it's methods or technology, always love to learn, always love to collaborate. Um, and also just what we talked about before, balancing the data driven decision making, what both with current data and forecasting data, as well as ensuring that the voice of our communities are heard is critical to success going forward. So thank you so much, everyone, to the attendees, to the panelists, to Shruti, to Mukena, and to the team Belong. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been such a joy having you here. And like you said, Amira, right, this has been one of the most like fun panels that I've been on in the last couple of months. So really enjoyed the discussion. And I'm going to take away the lovable cities today and see how we can all work together to, I guess I'll add Kira, your point, making lovable cities and at scale and building them at scale, right? Like helping all and so many of us. So thank you all today and um, so look forward to connected. Thank you, thank you. Just I just want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, would you like to? Ask? Yeah, sorry. No, I, I think I'll just say thank you because there's just so much to say, but I, I don't think you know I should take any more time. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great evening, morning. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.